Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. After the fine meal, we continue the conference. This is the panel number four, dealing with the problems of intelligence gathering and the appropriate relations between the two strongest powers rivals of our time. The public perception of intelligence gathering is that it is a clandestine, a mysterious, and cloudy enterprise. And it may be, may be so. But having good intelligence is a vital to making correct decision. On the other hand, the United States and Russia possess the most sophisticated intelligence gathering capacity in the world. It means what they are not, what they are not doing that does not exist. Although the intelligence is an important tool of the state power, it also serves the intelligence at large, enhancing public security. The question remains how to balance these two aspects of security. The speakers of the panel are well qualified to provide us with additional knowledge concerning the intelligence and the US-Russian relations. Saying this, I would like to turn to our speakers. Our first speaker is Mr. Jeffrey Gordon, the ex executive director of the Protect America Today Foundation. He has a bachelor degree in communication from the Pennsylvania State University, a master degree in diplomacy of the Norwich University, a certificate of the program on negotiation from the Harvard Law School, and is a graduate of the US Air Force's Air Command and Staff College. As a career Navy public affairs officer with 20 years experience, he has been the since spokesperson for numerous inter international events, as well as for the uh, Office of the Secretary of Defense. Since Mr. Gordon has left the Department of Defense, he has been a senior fellow and communication advisor to several think tanks. As a contributing columnist for the Fox News and the Washington Times since 2010, Mr. Gordon has regularly appeared on different international and national television and radio outlets. Mr. Gordon, you have the floor. Great to see you all today. I'd like to thank uh, Peter Antal so much for the kind invitation to appear again at the Antal Joseph Tutus Kapunt. I spoke here last year. It was a great experience, and I was very pleased upon coming back this year to see the staff has more than doubled in size, and the uh, conference has more than doubled in scope as well. And I'd like to thank uh, Petra so much, and uh, Zolt, and also uh, Yasmin for taking such great care of me while I'm here. And thanks also, Peter, and I expect to see AJTK be in the leagues of the Conrad Adenauer Stiftung and some of the greatest European think tanks in the years to come. So congratulations and thank you. Now we, uh, we mentioned a number of things in the last couple of days during the panel about the Cold War. And I'd just like to say that I loved uh, Professor Mark Kramer's presentation, uh, Harvard professor there. His was all text, but since I only studied at Harvard and I'm not a professor, mine's almost all pictures. So while the Cold War may be over, US-Russia relations are strained once again. We could see some of the pictures here. I think President Obama and, and Vladimir Putin, President Putin get along just about as their pictures depict them, which is not very well. And there are a number of flashpoints we have these days. Um, I do agree with Mark uh, Kramer's presentation where he had said that the Cold War was uh, principally ideological, this Marxist-Leninist thought versus the uh, liberal democracies. That's not the case anymore, of course. Uh, the US uh, and the West did prevail in the Cold War. But there are certainly a number of flashpoints. And, and those today, these heightened tensions are mostly about borders. And I think if you look at borders, um, those were some of the key factors, of course, in precipitating World War I and World War II. So I think borders make a big difference. And that's where most of the tension is right now between the US and Russia. 
Um, I would say Ukraine and Georgia occupations weigh very heavily on the minds of uh, Americans right now. Uh, they're also used for political issues too. I think in the United States, uh, we see a weakening in foreign policy that's been readily apparent. And when one country that's uh, been a strong power like the United States weakens, other countries that are uh, not uh, so respectful of the rule of law or territorial sovereignty move in to fill that vacuum. So I think as a career CKGB agent, I think Vladimir Putin sees the United States as being weak and ineffective, at least the leadership in Washington. So he's going to fill in there to, to uh, uh, move in there to fill that gap. Um, I've, I've agreed with just about everything said during the panels the last couple of days, but one thing I haven't heard that I say a lot on uh, TV and radio in the U.S. internationally and write quite a bit about columns is the reason, not just that the U.S. is weakening, but the reason Vladimir Putin has annexed uh, parts of Georgia, about 20 percent since uh, 2008, why he annexed Crimea this year, why his uh, forces are helping the separatists in Donetsk and Luhansk. And I think that's because of weakness, not because of Russian strength. Uh, Russia is slowly um, fading. They have a serious population implosion pro uh, problem right now. If you look at Russia 20 years ago, it was a 148 million people. Today it's 143 million people. And by 2050, Russia could be a Muslim majority country. Just because Russia has um, so many social problems, for one, uh, their population shrinking for the bulk of the population, except if you look in the Muslim majority areas down in the south and the North Caucasus, like in Dagestan and Chechnya and Gusechia. Those populations are rapidly rising. So Vladimir Putin realizes that to save Russia, he has to do a lot of dramatic changes. So what's he doing? He's implementing a, a totally new revamp of social issues in Russia, which is why you see uh, him doing things like uh, cracking down on uh, gay pride parades, the gay agenda. He sees it as a population threat. Russia happens to be the number one country in the world in abortion. Uh, 53 out of 1,000 women have abortions compared to the United States, which is relatively high in the world at 20. So they have a very big problem with that, number one. Uh, number two, uh, the divorce rate in Russia is the highest in the world at five per 1,000. And uh, number three, Russia still has the highest alcoholism in the world. Uh, the average life expectancy is 65. I remember when I was in Vladivostok working with the Russian Navy, uh, it, it was quite a lot of vodka shots, and I, I couldn't keep up with them nearly at all. I couldn't even try. None of us Americans could. But the problem with it is that the age expectancy of a man at the time was 59. So now it's a little higher, 65 is the total. And also Russia is the fastest growing um, place for HIV ep epidemic with 1.3 million people living with HIV, which is a tremendous amount, 1.3 million out of 143 million. So Russia has all these internal challenges. So basically Vladimir Putin is trying to reinstall what he calls uh, Russian values. He's turning to, to uh, the, the Christian church. He's doing a great propaganda campaign in the United States as well to win some of those folks over, to win evangelicals over, uh, for one, due to his uh, Christian uh, uh, outreach, uh, but also just due to everything he says and does with intelligence as well, which leads to, to the next slide. Uh, we've talked about the flashpoints with borders, Ukraine uh, occupation, occupation in Georgia, uh, the Syria conflict where Bashar al-Assad has uh, been backed by the, the Russians, and Vladimir Putin, in fact, makes a point that he's the one there to protect Christians in Syria, that he's helping Bashar al-Assad to do it. Uh, but there's also a problem with digital age espionage. Uh, right now, the U.S. has a delicate balance in maintaining our security. We have very few ways to protect ourselves in the United States. We had 9-11, and so one of the reasons that was done is the dots weren't connected between our intelligence agencies and our law enforcement agencies. So the United States does the best we can, this the country does, to make sure we can monitor um, whether it's emails, um, phone conversations, to make sure we're protected. Now the reality is, everybody in the world does that. It's just that the U.S. Uh, happened to get caught. Uh, and during the Cold War, things were pretty, pretty much romanticized for Cold War espionage. We had all the, the James Bond uh, series, the films, there were over 20 James Bond films, seven different A-list actors playing them, to something like 12 novels. Um, but it's not necessarily so glamorous as the stereotype. The digital age espionage spies aren't so glamorous. We're talking about Julian Assange from WikiLeaks, uh, of course, uh, Edward Snowden. Um, and talking about Edward Snowden, he, I'm going to talk about three of them. 
Edward Snowden is the first one I'll talk about, is, and that is, uh, it's very confusing in the United States where about 30% of the people think Edward Snowden's actually a hero, which uh, to me is kind of interesting considering he stole 1.7 million classified documents. And he, his justification was to expose what the US government is doing. The, the problem is there's been so much propaganda that supports him, uh, all pro partially through Russia TV in the United States, that a lot of people get confused. Now, now the far left likes Snowden in the United States because a lot of people on the far left don't like the United States. In fact, I had a debate on Russia, Voice of Russia radio with his lawyer uh, last year for a one hour radio debate. And this guy, his lawyer, brought up uh, slavery, the decimation of Native American populations, internment of Japanese Americans during World War II, um, Jim Crow laws, racism. I asked the guy, I said, do you like this country or not? I mean, what, what's, I mean, what's all this got to do with, uh, with Edward Snowden now? And, he, and basically his point was the United States has a lot to answer for. So the far left doesn't like the United States essentially, within the far, within the United States. He's a far left guy. He's definitely helped Vladimir Putin. In fact, Edward Snowden lied on his resume when, before he got the job as an NSA contractor and before he worked at the CIA. In fact, he had some earlier writings where he glorified China and the Chinese culture. So here was a guy that was very sympathetic to China. He was very anti-US. So he basically just threw it out to the world. He was looking for his 15 minutes of fame. He wanted to be like Julian Assange, who's an anarchist. Julian Assange would topple Western governments if given the chance just because he's, a, he's got some personality issues, allegedly a, a serial rapist too, according to the arrest warrant in, in Sweden. So Edward Snowden gave this program called the PRISM away, and I don't, I don't want to get into too many technical details, but the PRISM was, is, a, is, a, is a system whereby the internets go, not the ne necessarily the closest way, but the least expensive route. So the routers for Google, Google and uh, all sorts of other internet search engines were going through the United States and being monitored. So that's Edward Snowden. I think he's a traitor, he's a spy, and I, I don't think he has a very good life in Russia. I mean, um, I think that if he runs afoul of Vladimir Putin, he will find himself in Siberia very quickly, or worse. Ex Exhibit B, Bradley Manning is another big spy, uh, well known these days in the United States. He stole 700,000 classified documents, and one of the, one of the main things, main ways he tried to damage the United States is distort the actual view of uh, the real picture. One good example is that uh, collateral murder video. Uh, in those 700,000 documents that included videos and uh, classified files, uh, there's one video that was taken in Iraq from a helicopter crew, and that was of a, of a, of a missile hitting a Reuters camera crew. Two Reuters uh, guys, ones with the camera sticks, were, were killed, and um, basically, his apologists and people against the United States said, look, this is an example of just how the United States goes around killing journalists, killing innocent people on the battlefield. But what the video doesn't show is that in that same vicinity there were rocket-propelled grenade attacks against our soldiers, and as a helicopter flying very close over the scene, it's hard to see, it's in black and white, it's grainy, it's hard to see if those camera sticks and the guys running around was a rocket-propelled grenade or not. So it was that distorted view of the world that actually hurt U.S. prestige. But that was exactly Bradley Manning's point. And why did he do it? It wasn't because he loved Russia, it wasn't because he loved China, he was a guy that was actually bullied as a soldier. He was very uh, short in stature, like, I'm short in stature, so for me to say that to somebody, he's gotta be really short. It's like five, one, maybe very effeminate, and he was bullied. And so he was in Iraq and he, he basically said, well, I hate everybody I'm with, so I'm gonna download all these uh, classified files and, uh, on Lady Gaga CDs and then uh, basically give them to whoever wants them. So he, he was basically just like, uh, just like Snowden, I think like Lee Harvey Oswald types, people that hate the United States uh, without the gun, so to speak. And Exhibit C, who's an actual Russian, Anna Chapman, she has one of the world's most amazing stories just in preparing for the conference. I got to study a little bit about her. She was arrested in 2010 for espionage and she had almost reportedly um, seduced a cabinet member, which is just right below the president. We don't know which cabinet member, but she was with a Russian group of about uh, 10 spies. They were under cover in, in New York 
and she had, was able to penetrate uh, the political circles, and that, were, that, that was actually her mission. In the court documents, they had the actual cables that were sent to her and another uh, agent, and from Russian uh, SVR intelligence, basically saying to penetrate U.S. policy circles and file intel reports back. Well, she did a very good job if she was able to uh, almost seduce a cabinet member. So that is actually going back to almost the James Bond glamorous era. Uh, a lot of the spies aren't too glamorous, but she uh, breaks that mold. But meanwhile, even though we've talked about some of the main notorious spies we've had in the last uh, few years, uh, Snowden, Manning, and Chapman, there are a lot of other threats besides uh, US and uh, uh, Russian antagonism towards each other. There's the anonymous group, which are like uh, anarchists, similar to what uh, Julian Assange is. And then China. China is basically starting to hack the world right now. Um, there's a unit in Shanghai with uh, about uh, um, 2,000 people working at it, belonging to the PLA, the People's Liberation Army, and they've got about 1,000 servers for 2,000 people. You can see from the chart here uh, how many different attacks they've had in the U.S. and Canada, throughout Europe. So uh, the U.S. just filed charges against five senior PLA officers, officers with the Chinese military. And even though they're not going to be arrested anytime soon because they're going to stay in China, they won't be able to go to Las Vegas like so many Chinese do now. If you go to Las Vegas, you'll see a lot more Chinese. There used to be a lot of Japanese coming, but due to the economy, China has so much more money now, you'll see a lot of them in tourists. So no Disney World for them, no Las Vegas for them. That's about the worst we could do. Um, and just a kind of a humorous slide there, and about uh, Uncle Sam is like, ah, hey, I'm going to charge you with this, and oh, wait a minute, the Chinese already have the charges right there. So um, that is my presentation, and I'll turn it over to the next group. I did want to mention one thing for Luke's book, uh, The Mafia State. I haven't read it yet, but I love the title. Look forward to the book, because I call Russia the Mafia State uh, quite often. And that's one of the reasons why I think Ukraine wants to join the EU, so they're free of that Mafia State. So I think that's a big part of the, what we're seeing right now. Look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Gordon. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Luke Herding. He is a journalist, author, and award-winning correspondent with The Guardian. He has reported from a lot of conflict areas in the world. Because of his book, Mafia State, Mr. Harding was the first journalist expelled from <coughs> Russia since the Cold War. His last book, Snowden Files, is published 2014, and the Hollywood director, Oliver Stone, has obtained the cinema rights. Uh, Mr. Harding, you have the floor. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm very glad to be here. I flew by Ryanair and arrived 30 minutes before my speech to you today, so it's, so it's, it's wonderful that I actually made it. Um, but um, thank you. I, I, um, I think I agree with most of the panelists. I, I agree with Jeffrey broadly on Russia. I profoundly disagree with him on Edward Snowden for reasons I'll explain in a minute. But I think I, I was indeed thrown out of Russia. I was deported at, at the airport in 2011. And I think um, it's worth sharing briefly some of my experiences in Russia because similar things have befallen um, Russian uh, human rights workers, Russian journalists, but in particular Americans, American diplomats stationed at the um, US Embassy in Moscow, uh, and uh, Russian staffers working for Western embassies who've, who've been through the same thing. Uh, what happened to me was that I arrived, I work for the Guardian newspaper, I'm, a, I'm their kind of senior international correspondent, and I arrived in Moscow uh, in early 2007 with my wife and two small kids. Um, and um, having done various other kind of tours in, in, in different countries, and we were, this was Putin's second presidential term, Russian-British relations were in the deep freeze. Um, three months earlier, um, Alexander Litvinenko had been poisoned on, uh, in London with radioactive polonium in what I think, what the British government thinks was a kind of um, sort of FSB hit operation, the, the FSB being the successor agency to the KGB, as you all know. Um, and relations were pretty kind of, Poor, but but what what happened to me was that by April of 2007 I'd been plunged into what um, you can only call uh, a really badly written sort of spy drama. So so more old school than new school. But um, essentially what happened was that two of my colleagues interviewed Boris Berezovsky, the um, exiled 
oligarch who was living in London, and Berezovsky, who was a kind of extravagant figure prone to boasting, told my colleagues that he was plotting a revolution against Vladimir Putin. And so this story was on the front page of The Guardian the next day. I am plotting Russian revolution, says Boris Berezovsky. Uh, and my name was on the story because I phoned Dmitry Peskov, Putin's suave English-speaking press guy, for a quote. Um, and, and really, the next day, the sky fell on my head. Um, and uh, kind of the whole KGB sort of playbook, were, I, I feel I could, I could write it now. I could write the manual for, for new KGB recruits because I, I, I lived it. We lived it for almost three and a half years. Um, there was what the FSB calls uh, demonstrative nasleshka, which means sort of demonstrative pursuit, uh, which is old style, Inspector Clouseau, uh, unpromising young men in black leather jackets and brown shoes who would trail me around the streets of Moscow. I would go into a cafe, they would follow, I would sit down, they would sit down near me, um, and they would dump a big bag, presumably with a recording device, uh, on the table next to me and would go, Mojna? Like, you know, is that okay? And I go, da, da, konieshna. You know, yeah, fine, carry on, guys. Um, and, and this was kind of, this wasn't really scary, this was rather silly. Um, but that, that went on and off for a while. Um, and um, there was electronic uh, surveillance, which is pretty much par for the course, I think, for, for any foreign correspondent, any diplomat posted to, to, to Moscow, especially Brits and Americans. So um, whenever I made a phone call <clears throat> back to London and I... Uh, mentioned, I made a joke about Putin, for example, you could never make jokes about Putin, or um, mentioned Litvinenko, or talked about corruption, the line would be immediately be cut, and there'd be a kind of <laughs> like this, and then you redial, and then you make another joke about Putin, <laughs> Uh, and, and, and so on. And, uh, you know, uh, originally I thought this is automated software. And then after a while, I tried a little experiment, which was instead of saying Berezovsky, I would use the word banana uh, as a kind of code phrase. Um, and incredibly, I had a whole conversation about banana with my foreign editor in London, and nothing happened. So I concluded that this is actually a physical listening station in the Moscow suburbs with someone with a copy of Komsomolska Pravda in one hand, earphones in the other, who maybe they didn't like what I was saying, maybe they couldn't be bothered to write a report. Port, but anyway, they would cut the line. This, this went on for a long time. And pre-Snowden, um, everybody in Moscow knew that if you met, you took the battery out of your mobile phone um, and you, you talked without the mobile phone because we all knew that the, the, the security services could, could hack mobile phones. So there was that. Um, and then really the most kind of the, the most disagreeable aspect of this kind of harassment, which dates back to the 1960s and 1970s, it dates back to what the KGB called operational psychology, um, was used by the Stasi in, in communist East Germany, in fact, in other Warsaw Pact countries as well. But the, the most insidious part was that the FSB would break repeatedly into the flat where I uh, live with my wife and two small kids, and they, would, they wouldn't steal stuff like your average burglar who takes your TV or, or, or whatever. They would leave kind of demonstrative clues that they've been there that any idiot could find. So, for example, the, the central heating um, in, our, in our flat, in our dacha was disabled, so it was kind of, it had been sort of snipped, someone had sawn through it, so it was kind of, you know, our, our flat was freezing cold. Um, photos of my family on my laptop were deleted, the office was repeatedly broken into and the window left open, um, and... Um, the, the thing that most annoyed me was that when we lived on the 10th floor of a, of a new apartment block, my, my son's bedroom window, he was six at the time, and the bed was right next to the window with a big drop to the door, to the courtyard below. Um, the, somehow the window had been unlocked and it was propped open. And so the symbolism was fairly clear to decipher. It was kind of, we don't like what you're doing. If you carry on, maybe your kids meet with a little accident. That, that was the message from the FSB. And this, this is, we're talking 207, 208, 209, so pre-Ukraine, about the time of the war in Georgia. And I took advice from the British Embassy, who said, off the record, um, yeah, it's the FSB, this is the worst kept diplomatic secret in Moscow, we are targeted, the American Embassy is targeted. Subsequently, I read the cables leaked by Julian Assange um, via WikiLeaks, where the American ambassador is, is complaining repeatedly to the US State Department in Washington about these house intrusions, saying they have reached unprecedented levels. And it, it, if you like, I think what you could see was the kind of maturation of 
the, the, the Putin idea, um, a return to KGB methods, an increase in resourcing, the FSB becoming Russia's sort of preeminent institution. Um, and I'll just share one other anecdote with you because I think it's quite illuminating. Um, the FSB actually opened a criminal investigation into the Berezovsky story that I mentioned to begin with, and I was summoned to Lefortova, which I'm sure you've all heard of. You're all good scholars of this period, Lefortova prison where used to be KGB detention center, it's now a pre-detention center for the FSB, where, where Mikhail Kurakovsky was kept, where Alexander Litvinenko was kept, and I was summoned for an interview. And basically they phoned up the Guardian office in Moscow and said, you know, we would like to interview you. And I said, well, I don't really want to be interviewed by you. And they said, um, you've got no choice, bring a lawyer. Um, so I turned up outside Lefortova um, into this building, again, which looks, I guess this audience must have seen The Life of Others, the wonderful Oscar-winning uh, drama film uh, set, in, set in 1980s East Germany, but it, it looked very much like the, the, the kind of Stasi building at the start of that film with um, uh, kind of etiolated corridors, um, cameras that sort of followed you round, and I wandered up with my lawyer to room 306 and, and knocked on the door where someone who called himself uh, Lieutenant Kuzmin, a, a kind of young guy in an olive green FSB uniform was waiting to interrogate me. Um, and the, the interview itself was, was pointless. It was just a kind of exercise in trying to uh, scare me. Um, but what I remember was, actually, could you give me a glass? Just pass me a glass. The glass. So there was a glass on the FSB headquarters on the table of Lefort of a prison. So there was a bottle of water and there was a glass and it had four initials on it. And the initials were, I wonder if anyone can guess, first initial, Cheka. Next initial, Ogpu. Uh, the NKVD was missing uh, for some reason. Uh, then KGB, KGB, and then FSB on the glass in Lefort of it. So basically it was clear, it was clear that the FSB saw itself uh, in the same Czechist conspiratorial tradition as, 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 as Lenin's kind of first secret police. Um, and despite the supposed end of the Cold War, despite um, you know, rapprochement in the 1990s, the, the advent of, of Vladimir Putin, the, the, these, these methods um, being deployed by, by, by the Kremlin were, were identical. Um, and just finally on that, um, one of the big um, uh, devices used against foreign correspondents like myself during the whole Cold War period was cancellation of visa, denial of visa. Um, and one of my predecessors uh, for The Guardian, we've had several kind of wonderful correspondents who've covered Moscow. The first one, um, uh, the first one in sort of 1917, um, and then in the 1930s, there was someone called Malcolm Muggeridge, who was a left-wing, clever, Fabian um, intellectual who went to Stalin's Moscow and was horrified about what he, he saw and wrote a a satirical fictional novel called Winter in Moscow. I, I don't know if anyone's read it, it's long out of print, but it's a, it's a gorgeous book. And in it, he, he says that the threat of losing your visa kind of hangs over you and has been a kind of motif in US-Russian, US-British relations all the way through. Um, through the 60s, where American correspondents were, were kicked out, through the 70s, even through the mid-1980s, the early Gorbachev period, where US correspondents were being expelled. Um, and precisely that happened to me. I um, had almost four years of harassment. Um, the British Embassy knew about this. They complained privately to me, to the Russian Foreign Ministry. It, it would tail off for three or four months, then it res would resume. Um, and essentially, I came back, uh, having written a book on WikiLeaks and Julian Assange in, in February of 2011 and handed over my passport at Passport Control. And I don't know, for you people who are scholars of Russia and perhaps critics of Russia, whenever you go into Moscow, you do arrive with a slight sinking feeling, wondering what will happen. Well, in my case, the woman sort of tapped in my passport details uh, from the Federal Migration Service, which is part of the FSB, and then went, did a kind of a physical spring off her seat uh, and funneled my passport away to someone else. And about six or seven minutes later, uh, a more senior guy from the FSB came out um, and said, um, uh, Delia Vos, Russia, Sakrita, which means for you, Russia is closed. And I said, um, Pachimu, why? And he said, Yanis I, I, I don't know. Vistotas Jelly, did you do something? And I said, Nyet, Yanichivon is Jel. No, I didn't do anything. Um, and after this Socratic conversation, uh, which, which told me precisely nothing about why my visa had been canceled and I was being deported, I was escorted back to, against the flow of incoming passengers to the deportation zone and I was kicked out of the country. Um, and um, so, 
I mean, I think what's interesting about that, apart from, uh, you know, is you would expect that this would not be happening now, but it is happening now. It is happening now because, in a sense, on, on a more kind of intellectual level, I don't think Vladimir Putin has come up with a new idea. I think his spies are using the same training manual that he first uh, leafed through at KGB school in Leningrad. Um, and this is being wheeled out. ABC had a story last week about how American diplomats now, 2014, are uh, basically suffering from the same things that I do, which is a kind of low-level harassment, psychological harassment, KGB-style harassment, which is designed to make you throw up your arms and say, I will leave the country. Uh, it's effective, it's cheap, um, and it's very nasty. Um, I'll, I'll just speak for two minutes on Snowden, because I know I'm, I'm almost out of time, uh, just to say that I also have experience of being spied on by the Americans, so, <laughs> so I've, I can do a kind of comparative um, study. I um, was part of the team that, that worked on the Edward Snowden documents um, uh, with The Guardian, um, and was in a kind of secret bunker in London examining this material uh, last summer when we were co cooperating with him shortly after Glenn Greenwald, uh, a colleague of mine, Ewan McCaskill, and Laura Poitras, the documentary maker, had spent a week with Snowden in Hong Kong from where I've just come. Um, and I would say I, I profoundly disagree, respectfully disagree with Jeffrey. Uh, first of all, Snowden is not far left. He voted for Ron Paul. He is uh, of the right. He comes from a patriotic family. He is a Republican. He's a kind of libertarian. He's basically kind of Tea Party. That's what his politics are. Secondly, he's not a spy. Even Mike Rogers, the, the new incoming head of the NSA, has acknowledged that um, Snowden wasn't working for Russian intelligence or Chinese intelligence or whatever. Um, whether you agree with what he did or, or, or didn't do, he um, sees himself as a patriot. I regard him as a whistleblower. The Guardian and the Washington Post won the Pulitzer Prize in May for Public Service, the highest award in journalism. So I think a lot of people agree that he, he did an enormous service. Um, and um, just finally, Jeffrey says, everybody in the world does what the NSA, GCHQ, the British Spy Agency are doing. That's just not true. That's not true. What Snowden told us is what the NSA is doing uh, in the years from 9-11 is essentially trying to gather everybody's data on a global scale. So has essentially hacked into using Prism, all, all of the, uh, the big Silicon Valley companies, has hacked into the fiber optic cables which ring the world. Um, it's collecting all sorts of communications. And one of the British programs that we wrote about, that I wrote about, is called Tempora, and its code name is Mastering the Internet. And this is the ambition. It's extraordinary ambition. The ambition is to collect everyone's communications, to sift them, to query them, and to seek out the bad guys. But what Snowden did, I think, um, was uh, a wonderful thing. Um, and for anybody uh, living in a democracy, it throws up profound questions about, sure, the boundaries between national security um, and uh, privacy, but, but also about accountability, about legal oversight, and so on. Um, and I actually think Snowden is a great figure. Thank you. Thank you very much, for Mr. Harding, for this very emotional lecture about your That's own <laughs> personal experience. Also funny. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Our next speaker on the agenda is Dr. Mark Lowenthal. Uh, he is an internationally recognized expert on intelligence. He is the president and chief executive officer of the Intelligence and Security Academy, LLC, a national security education training and consultancy company. Dr. Leventhal has written extensively on intelligence and national security issues. His most recent book, Intelligence from the Sec uh, Secrets to Policy, has become the standard college and graduate school textbook uh, on the subject. Dr. Leventhal is a frequent public commentator, commentator on intelligence issues of the major networks and uh, his opens uh, have appeared in the New York Times and the Washington Post. Dr. Leventhal, Thank you. the floor is yours. I've spent my entire life as an intelligence analyst. So one of the problems with being an intelligence analyst is that you're not a spy and you don't deal with spies. And so this is gonna seem somewhat mundane, I'm afraid, after the last two presentations. But I, what I'm gonna talk about is how the changing global situation, the changing relationship between the United States and Russia, the United States and China, has affected the business of intelligence, meaning analysis. I will make just one comment on Mr. Snowden, 
Whistleblowers don't go to China, and whistleblowers don't go to Russia. If you're a whistleblower, you stand and fight. And so that's all I'm going to say about Mr. Snowden. So to move on. Um, the thing that's interesting about U.S. intelligence is that we've gone through at least four rapid transitions of what we do in the last um, 25 years. The first trans the, we spent the first 42 years of our existence in a very stable environment. I, I disagree with Professor Kramer somewhat on context about the stability of the Cold War period. And then we underwent a series of transitions, and that's still the problem in intelligence. The first transition obviously came with the end of the Cold War. As uh, the current director of national intelligence, Jim Clapper, puts it, we lost the enemy we came to know and love. They quit. They went home. And it just wasn't fair. Um, and it left us adrift as to what we did. Because 50 cents of every intelligence dollar went to the Soviet problem, or the Soviet Warsaw Pact problem, or the Soviet satellite problem. And suddenly, there was no Soviet problem. And one of the things that happened that was interesting was that there was no victory parade. There was no celebration. In fact, this was very conscious on the part of President Reagan and President Bush 41 not to celebrate the end of the Cold War, to let the Russians down easy so that there would be a very peaceful transition. Now, clearly, Vladimir Putin would like to have a recount on that system, but that was the concept at the time. And so we then began a transition to more transnational issues, counterterrorism, counter-narcotics, crime. Now, we had been doing those all the time but there were secondary issues to the Soviet issue. Um, we had this interesting moment at the beginning of the Clinton administration where the incoming administration said in 1993, um, with the end of the Cold War, the role of intelligence has changed. No, it has not, and no, it does not. And this is an important point I want to leave you with. The role of intelligence is always the same, regardless of what the target set is. Our job is to provide analysis for policymakers to make decisions. It doesn't matter if it's the Soviet Union or Russia or drugs or terrorism. The role doesn't change. One thing that did change, obviously, was in 9-11 in 2001, we got attacked and we went to war. And I will tell you, when the United States goes to war, the entire intelligence community goes to war. But this was a very different war for us. Because this war was largely tactical, fought at a very small level, picking out individuals, finding individuals, taking them off the street in some cases, um, eliminating them from operations. And this changed how intelligence worked. One of the previous directors of Central Intelligence, General Mike Hayden, said, I don't have analysts anymore. I have targeters. They're not doing analysis. They're following cars and saying, that's the car we want to get. And this is still a problem in the CIA. Um, John Brennan, who's the current director, has said he's tried to change that. And I will tell you, he has founded an uphill fight. Um, one of the problems we faced with the terrorism war was similar to the Cold War. How does it end? Now, nobody planned for the end of the Cold War, and one day it just ended. The terrorism war is somewhat similar. How will you know when it's over? How will you know that the last attack is the last attack? We're not going to have a surrender ceremony. Just one day we're going to sort of realize maybe it's over. Um, the third transition actually happened last year. President Obama gave a speech at the uh, National Defense University, which is in Washington, D.C., and he talked about the need to step back from the emphasis on terrorism, saying that we cannot maintain operations and concentration at this level for a continuing period of time, that it affects who we are as a nation, and we have to step back. And then we had the emergence of ISIL, or ISIS, you can choose whichever one you like, and that seems to be the fourth transition, which calls into question the third. So this has been a very rapid series of changes for U.S. intelligence. Now, to take you back to the beginning again, some of you may remember, at the end of the Cold War, a, uh, an American political scientist, Francis Fukuyama, wrote an article in a book called The End of History and the Last Man. And Fukuyama's premise was that with the collapse of communism, we had hit the end of political evolution that liberal Western democracy had won, and it was over. Now, some people questioned whether or not that was a good call. Some people said there will be another ism inevitably to counter Western liberal democracy. Nobody foresaw that it was going to be religious fundamentalism. That came out of a place that no one had suspected. But the other shift that has begun to happen is the return of the nation state issue. Now, nation states never go away. 
Nation states are the basic coin of the realm in international politics. And we've had North Korea, and we've had Serbia, and we've had Iran, but what we now have is the return of the large nation state issue. Nation states that can't be ignored simply because they're big, because they have a large economy, or a large military, or a certain amount of geography, or all three. And obviously we're talking about two nations here. We're talking about a newly powerful China and a continuingly resentful Russia. Two similar but different issues. And in both of these countries, and somebody's already mentioned this, there are two things you always want to know, capabilities and intentions. Capabilities are pretty easy to tell for nation states. Intentions are changeable. You have to change your mind. One of the other changes in this period, and here again I'm going to disagree somewhat with Professor Kramer, is that the Cold War was pretty stable. There were a series of unwritten rules of the road, and we in the Soviet Union pretty much knew what they were most of the time. Sometimes we'd veer off the end, but pretty much we avoided that. Now there is no stability, and there are no real rules of the road. And so it has become much more difficult to figure out the behaviors that you're expecting, that you're trying to influence in other states. Um, interesting, China and Russia are in the same place in many ways. They are both resentful. China is resentful of its treatment over the last 150 years, when it was overrun by European powers, when it was treated very, very badly. And part of its resentment has to be about Russia, which seized large chunks of territory from China, which the Chinese constantly remind them about. But China basically looks at the United States now and says, OK, your time is over. Step aside. You need to abdicate your position as world power. We're next. And we tend not to respond to that. The Russian resentment is different. They've lost power. They've lost prestige. They're no longer our equal. And so they also feel that something has gone wrong. So what does all of this mean if you're an intelligence analyst? Now here, I must tell you, um, my views on this are really shaped by the fact that I spent three years managing the intelligence priority system for the President of the United States. And every day you sort of wake up and look at the world and play roulette. I'm going to put analysts here and collectors here, and with a little luck I won't get it wrong. And every other day you get it wrong. There's things that come up on the charts that you never worried about the day before, like Mali. You know, why would you worry about Mali on a given afternoon until suddenly one day you've got Al-Qaeda in Mali? So, this is happening to the United States at the same time that we've had an interesting workforce change. Our, the intelligence budget is going down. The intelligence budget peaked at $80 billion. That's clearly not classified. I wouldn't have told you that. It's gone down to $59 billion, which is still a fair amount of money. Let's be serious. But it's a lot less than 80. And we have an interesting issue with our analysts. Most of the analysts that we hired since 9-11 in 2001 have worked on these tactical issues, on counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. And now we're telling them, think about strategic issues. You know, where, where is Putin going in the Ukraine? What is the future of the Chinese Navy? And it is my belief, and it's the belief of many of my colleagues, that it is much easier to go from strategic to tactical than to go from tactical to strategic. So there's a mindset problem, and there's an experience problem. So here are some of the issues that I, if I was still managing analysts, I would urge them to think about in terms of both Russia and China. For Russia, the key issue, as JD says, it's decline. Putin has a losing hand. He's playing his losing hand really, really well, but he's playing a losing hand, and I think he knows this. I think his goal is to grab as much as he can before he runs out of cards. Um, JD mentioned their demographics. There's a chance they will be down to 90 million people by the middle of the century. Russians just simply don't care about the future and don't want to have babies. Um, economically, Russia is a third world country. They export natural resources. They export gold, timber, oil, natural gas. Uh, a year ago, I had to buy a new TV set. I went to the TV store. You know, I didn't sit saying, let's see, the Japanese one, the Korean, oh, the Russian one, that's the one I want. You know, it just, it doesn't happen. Um, energy is a big problem for Putin. Energy, Putin needs oil to be at $110 a barrel for his budget to close. I haven't looked at oil prices in the last three or four days. The last price I saw was $78.85. That doesn't work. So eventually he runs out of money. And then you really have to ask if Putin is serious about trying to reconstitute parts of the Soviet empire. I always liked Lenin's phrase, a prison house of nations. I am hard put to believe that you can be successful if that's your goal. If you're spending all your time holding down your own domestic population, 
as has been explained through how they do this, that's a huge waste of your resources. And so if you're an analyst looking at Russia, you have to ask yourself, what does their decline look like? And how do they react in decline? And what are the things you're going to look for if they react badly? China, on the other hand, is a different issue. China, this is gonna sound condescending and I'll apologize in advance, they're sort of like a child learning to walk and they keep bouncing into a lot of furniture, which they're not quite sure of their own strength and their own stability. Um, you have to understand the China that we have today is a wholly anomalous China. A successful, stable China shows up about once every 150 years. So the last time we saw this in China was in the late 18th century. And, China, and China's current stability is built on an interesting premise. We stay in charge, you make money. Now that's great as long as you're making money, but we all know what happens to every capitalist economy in the world you inevitably hit a recession. So what happens inside of China politically when that happens to them is a really intriguing question. China also has um, some interesting demographic issues. They have finally gotten away from the one child, a family um, pro model, but they have, in the, in the decades when they had that, the preference was clearly for a boy. That was what you wanted. So there is an excess of between 20 and 40 million Chinese males between the ages of 20 and 40 who have no prospect of ever getting married. I would suggest to you this is not a recipe for social success. If you're a woman, it's a great dating opportunity. If you're a guy, it's not so good. Um, and if you have a demographic problem, either in Russia or in China, it takes you 20 years to pull out of the dive. And so it's China, to me, China strikes me as a very unstable prospect by mid-century. So again, those are the types of questions I think we have to be asking ourselves. Um, what does instability look like in China, which I'm not in favor of, and what do we do about it? So, some last points on, on the role of intelligence. Um, you have to understand that intelligence is not about making predictions, and it's not about making forecasts. I know that's what you think that we, the weatherman makes forecasts, and you know what his record is like. He said, sunny and warm, and you're standing in a driving rain. We're not in that line of work. What we're doing is laying out possible outcomes in the order in which we think they are likely, because you cannot eliminate certain outcomes. That's what estimation is about, and that's what we do. And so it's likelihood and importance are the two factors you have to think about. And the key attribute of all intelligence, no matter what you're doing, is trying to help policymakers reduce their uncertainty. You can never eliminate their uncertainty. You can reduce their uncertainty. A closing thought. Um, Secretary of State Lawrence Eagleburger, who was Secretary of State at the end of the Bush 41 administration and a longtime Soviet specialist, said that it was wrong to be nostalgic about the Cold War. Now, there is a certain allure about the Cold War. It was such a lovely, simple world. There was us and there was them, and the world seemed to work that way. The trouble is that's not the world that we have anymore. There's no us and them, or there's us and lots of them. And the world is inherently more volatile, and the world is inherently much more unstable than it was during the Cold War. And so if you're managing intelligence, it's much more difficult to figure out what you're concentrating on every morning, and what sort of analysts do you want to buy, and what sorts of languages should they be working on, and what sorts of skills do they have to have. Um, but that's the reality of the intelligence world today. Policymakers try to reshape the world. Intelligence analysts try to understand where it's going. Thank you. Thank you very much, for Dr. Lowenthal. It was a very interesting and informative lecture, and especially very important that you have uh, spoken about the uh, importance of the analysis and estimators uh, about the knowledge which uh, does help to make decisions. Thank you very much. And our next speaker is Mr. Nikolai Zlobin. He was a former professor of the Moscow State University, and he also served as an advisor to the Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev and to his successor, Russian President Boris Yeltsin. Between 19 1993 and 2000, Mr. Zlobin held position as a visiting professor and research fellow at a number of universities and research institutions in the United States. He was from 2001 to 2012 the director 
of the Russian and the Eurasian programs Center for Defense Information. In 2012, he founded and became president of the Center on Global Interests. It is a non-profit research organization with the declared goal to create an organization that would uh, go beyond the Cold War thinking and to provide a strategic long-term vision for the Russian-US relations. Mr. Slobin, you have the floor. Thank you. I, uh, it's my first time in Hungary, and I'm very grateful to the center and to its staff. They taken care of us so well. So I feel like I would like to be invited sometimes again. <laughs> And uh, too straight, right? <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, I noticed that I um, do speak the last one, and uh, I feel like quite a responsibility to summarize all things we were talking about in two days. And I remember, maybe some of you do remember the famous Russian movie about the Russian spy in. Berlin in, during World War II, uh, 17 Moments of Spring, who is actually a favorite Putin's character, who said once, you know, doesn't matter what you say, people will remember the last one thing you said. So I'm the last one thing on this conference. But I hope you will remember great things, particularly on this panel, because I learned a lot. Uh, but uh, what I want to start with, uh, you know, I spent half my time in Russia, half of my time in the United States, and it's always amazed me how much we do not understand each other. It's, it's amazing, really. Uh, it's like we work very hard not to understand each other. Uh, and sometimes it's like two narratives. I understand that we had two narratives during Cold, uh, Cold War. That was ideological, historical, whatever propaganda uh, matter. Why we even have much less understanding now, that's a very good question. And sometimes I ask myself as a political expert, uh, Mark as an intelligence expert, and my old friend Luke as a journalist, how much we are responsible for this misunderstanding. <laughs> you know? <laughs> I. Then I, you know, thought, you know, I was married for a long time. I had an American wife, and I know we do not understand each other. We divorce now, <laughs> even on personal level. So, so there is something, uh, you know, Russians and Americans with all similarities. Big countries, very uh, uh, big economies, you know, very, very uh, diverse and uh, ambitious, but. We, we, we are really very, very different. And my wife always complained to me that she never, exp she never knows how I would react. And I always knew that I, I never knew how she would react on something. And when we talk about big countries, we really don't know how we would react on anything. So I think this is one of big pro problem people like Mark facing all the time. It's very hard to predict each other's reaction. I, I would say that um, I agree with Mark when he said that when Soviet Union uh, disappeared, intelligence community faced a very difficult time. First of all, nobody predicted it. I read all of these analytical papers in 80s and early 90s, nobody ever seriously considered the uh, disappearance of, of the Soviet Union, the end of communism. Neither KGB or CIA or whoever was analyzing that and uh, never could give a political leadership a clear or more or less clear idea that that could happen, be ready. And I remember famous, somebody mentioned yesterday, uh, George Bush, the senior, Kiev chicken speech in Kiev, right before the end of the Soviet Union. People in Russia were laughing on it because it was so far away from realities. And that was the way of American. I, I don't know who was preparing stuff for the speech, but that was far away from realities. And since that, you know, I, talking to my Russian friends, they lost respect for American intelligence community because that was something really far away uh, from what was going on in. Uh, Soviet Union. And then I read all of this, a lot of at least uh, analytical papers right after breakup of the Soviet Union, both sides, on Russian and American sides. And majority of them were saying that now inevitably Russia and the United States will become a good allies. We are friends now, 
we have same enemies, we have same goals, we both liberal democracies, liberal economies, we can have some differences, but we will work together. And entire assumptions, like general assumptions, that now we have to solve particular, you know, small, rather problems, but in general scale, we have like, we're facing Arab world, we're facing China, and these two big power, super nuclear power, should work together because there's no obstacles for that, and it again did not happen. Again, intelligence community gave on both sides, both, both leadership, very false ideas, not to prepare them for the current situation. So I understand, I very sympathize with Mark's point that, you know, we really lost objectives. Russians and American intelligence community we lost objectives, and that's the first big problem we are facing now. In a previous uh, panel, uh, Dr. Tsikankov was talking about New World Order, and I think uh, this is a second big challenge for intelligence community uh, now how to assess it, because we used to feel like we are the Russian, Soviet Union, or United States, biggest superpower. We can set a global agenda, at least we can influence global agenda, and we did during Cold War. And we found ourselves in a position that we cannot do it anymore. Everybody now talking about like multipolar world. I'm not signing. I'm not signing for this idea. I believe we're moving what I called power. Uh, how to call it? A polarless world. I don't see any global power capable in the nearest future and decades to come to set global agenda. I think we're in much worse situation. I think the world become much more dangerous. And uh, I even cannot predict the configuration of this uh, polarless world, but I'm sure that United States and Russia and China and European Union not there, uh, incapable to put this world in the order, considering two, two or three factors, I feel like I would mention this, and I feel like they are important. First of all, try to give me definition of global power now, superpower. I think we don't have the definition even. We use the definition, you know, we used like 25, 30 years ago. It doesn't work anymore. Russia has the same, you know, nuclear arsenal at the same size of the country. It's Yes, the structure of economy is bad, but it's still the sixth uh, global economy by the size. So it's su supposed to be superpower, but it's not. European Union, I don't know, are you superpower? I don't think so. What, what's the meaning of superpower? What we should do, what we should invest in to become a superpower in 21st century? People, economy, nuclear weapons, energy, technology, I don't know, nobody knows. During Cold War, it was clear what we needed. We need a big army, we need a nuclear arsenal to be a superpower, we need like certain, certain things. Now I don't know. And I think that's a big question for anybody who would like to put this world in order, what we have to invest in the next quarter of century. We have money, what to do with the money? Nobody wants to repeat mistake Japan made like quarter of century ago, which was a great, practically superpower. Now it's like somewhere in a province of global powers. I think we live in a, and this is a very serious challenge for intelligence community, what Mark was talking about, to project the st st strategy. I think we live in the world where small and middle-sized countries set the global agenda. Look, North Korea, Iraq, Georgia, Ukraine, you name it. And big countries got involved in these conflicts, sometimes against their will and they don't know what to do because they were preset for different kind of conflicts between United States and Russia, Soviet Union, China, nuclear conflict. We don't know how to solve regional problems, regional conflicts after Cold War. We just don't know how to do that. And this is another very serious challenge for global intelligence, global security community because every this uh, regional conflict can lead to a real big war and we see it in Ukraine. What to do with an army? What kind of army we need? Look in the United States. It's the biggest army in the world, the biggest military budget in the world, cannot win a single war. What to do? 
Putin now militarizing Russia. I, I'm not sure that this is the right way to. I told Putin. I had chance to tell Putin uh, like two weeks ago in his face that I think he's making mistakes. America did after September 11, 2001, the same mistakes, militarizing the country, building up patriotism, nationalism, cutting on democracy. He argued with me, of course, but. The point is, I think Russia going the same way as America did after 2001. And Russia now putting all money in a, in a military uh, spending, militarizing economy. But nobody can answer, intelligence community can't answer the question, what kind of army do we need now? Do we need this conventional army? Do we need nuclear army? What do we need for the current situation in the world? Why do we need uh, nukes? What kind of nukes do we need? And so on. So, so there are so many questions we don't have answers yet. So I'm not sure. Yes, Cold War is over. By the way, I like your idea that nobody celebrated Cold War, the end of Cold War. And by the way, that's true. You know, uh, for many years I was concerned about this. Why Cold War was only war and ended up with no peace treaty. Nobody set the rules. The victors, uh, countries who considered to be uh, you know, victors in World War II, they never set the rules how we're going to live after World War II. So now Putin really saying, you know, you're absolutely right. Russia saying we did not lose World War, uh, sorry, Cold War. We didn't lose Cold War. We just step aside. We, we leave the battle because that was good for us for now. Now we're coming back. But we never lose. Who told you we lose? We're smarter than you guys. You, you thought you, you, you won. We, you didn't won. We just hide for a while. And now we are back. So anyway, but so all these questions, it's very serious, strategic, intellectual challenges we have to solve. Yes, Ukraine is important. Yes, 2008 Georgia was important. Yes, it's important to fight Al-Qaeda or ISIS, but strategically wise, we are very incapable, I believe, to understand where the world goes to, what the new world order will be, what the driver, what the main forces, what the main danger, main threats, main, main trends are, are going to be. And that's the biggest, I think, challenge for the um, intelligence community strategically now. Now, I, I will talk a little bit about Russia. Yes, I, I'm, I'm Russian, so uh, I think it's important uh, for me to try to explain Russia to you, current Russia to you. You know, uh, when Vladimir Putin became a president, maybe you, some of you remember that, the 2000, uh, on a celebration of uh, KGB day, professional celebration, they had a professional FSB celebration day, first time he was a president, look, you probably remember that, he said, he stand on the podium and said, I have to report to you guys, the mission achieved, KGB, run the country. He was joking, but you know, as Russians say, every joke has a piece of joke. Uh, so yes, that's first time in Russian history the man from intelligence service became a president of the country. Well, Andropov was in the past uh, head of KGB. Then he was member of Politburo, was prime minister and so on. But that's big change for democratic Russia. And uh, I, I check the numbers, I, I probably everybody knows the numbers, probably Luke definitely knows the numbers. Uh, 10 million, 10 million uh, Russian bureaucrats who works in Russian offices all over this uh, hierarchy, state hierarchy came from intelligence, 10 million. 40% of Russian political elite now came from there. That's a serious number, 40%. 22 federal agencies related to this intelligence, security, law enforcement. And in presidential administration, according to people who do this kind of research, to Krishanovsky, if you know her research in Russia, 60% of presidential administration people Putin's administration came from uh, intelligence service. 60% of they run the country. So the problem is that uh, they know the way how they're going to do that. They're not politicians. 
Putin, I had many occasions talking to him. I don't know, was I lucky or unlucky, but I was talking to him many times. And once he said, we were sitting on the dinner, and he said to me, I, I was talking about politics, and he said, you know, Nikola, I am not a politician. I said, how come you, president of Russia, you're not a politician? He said, I'm not a politician. I never built my political career. I never was belong to any political parties. I don't own anything to any political forces. I don't report to any political structures. I make decisions as I see is the right decision for Russia. So I'm not a politician. So, and we talked for like a few minutes about this. I was actually shocked. But then I understand that's true. You know, when we do trying to analyze him as a politician, we make this mistake. He's not a politician. He sees himself as a, in a very different role. You can describe this role in a different words and different definitions, but it's not a political logic. Political logic doesn't apply to, to, to Putin or to his uh, way running, how he runs Russia. That's what's important. That's why they take things which typical European or Western American politician would take seriously, they ignore it. And they somehow manage to explain it to Russians, and Russians don't know, you know, Russia has very poor experience, Russian people have very poor experience in democracy, of course. Very few elections, very few years of free press, so it's very easy for Russians to go back. And the Russian political elite now, all the Siloviki, all this intelligence service, law enforcement people in Russian political elite, explain to them in a very traditional way that the rest of the world is against Russia, we have to build our fortresses, we have to protect ourselves from the evil uh, West, particularly European, European Union and the United States, and people buy it because that's the way they know life. You can't blame Russians for that. That's a very traditional view of the world and Putin using it very, very well. But for politicians, for Western politicians, it's a big, I think, an intelligence community, it's a big mistake to take them as a politicians. They don't behave, they don't need to be reelected. Yes, Putin stay for a long time, will stay for a long time. He doesn't need anybody. I, you know, I'm convinced, I said it many times and I wrote a book on this, Putin is a single, single guy, doesn't need advisors, he doesn't, he takes responsibility on himself and when you talk to anybody, and probably, look, you did, you talk in Kremlin asking who is in charge of, who helping Putin to put together foreign policy, nobody. Economic policy, nobody. There's no, nobody. It's him. His decision, unpredictable. There is no way to predict how he will act. There is no way to influence him. And it's not a politics. And when now we have this uh, confrontation between West and Russia, we have to understand that this confrontation is between Western political elite and Russian intelligence elite. We speak in different languages. We speak in different terms. And Putin believes he's going to win for a very simple reason. He's not going to be reelected. He doesn't care about elections. He doesn't have to solve his policy like every four years, every five years to, uh, to the public. He will overrule, he will oversee Obama as he did oversee Clinton, uh, George Bush. He'll oversee the next American president. He doesn't take them seriously. So he is there for a while. And unless we will start to take, yeah, I'm almost done, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, take him as a, as a operative, intelligence operative who operates in a spats ups, not a political terms. I think we will misread them every time as we do it now in Ukraine. Uh, we have to understand that Putin is very successful politician. He's very skillful, very skillful, very talented, no questions about that, very charismatic. He's not a simple guy. I believe that he, his power comes from his deep belief in his own way to get to the Kremlin. He, own, he knows his way. He doesn't know any other things. He doesn't know competition. He never went through the competition. He never went through elections. He never went through campaigning and so on. Free press, you know, attacking by opposition. No, he knows his way. 
he believes this is a successful way. You have to consider, actually, that he came in power in 2000, nobody knew him, was zero rating. He had no political program, he had no power. And he was recommended by Boris Yeltsin, who had at that time, like, almost zero rating, was the most hated politician at that time in Russia. He recommended Putin, so Putin was preset to lose. And now we have this most powerful, according to, you know, some American media, most powerful politician in the world in 15 years. So this is how he operates. So he knows his way. And to try to put him, to recommend him to use some other ways, like democracy, elections, will always fail. So that's how we uh, have to, we have to understand that Russia is a country, I believe, I'm Russian, so I, I can put my Russian head and say, Russia is a country, not a system. Russia is a country of individuals and a leader. It's a leadership country. Good leader, you know, Russia moving toward democracy. Bad leader, Russia moving toward like less democracy, let's say. Now we have bad Putin, Russia moving from democracy. So we have to understand that leadership in Russia plays much bigger role than in the European Union and the United States to take it as a given thing. Don't argue about it. This is how it is. Try to work with a guy. If you don't like him, try to work harder. If you don't like him, still try to. There will be no other guys in Russia. So, and I will leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting lecture. After having all lectures, is the question, do you have any remarks or comments to each other lectures? Please. Thank you very much. I, I guess we'll just start down here. Just um, a few different uh, clarifications and rebuttals. Uh, the first is for Nikolai. For the U.S. military, even though it is the biggest, um, we did have victories for Afghanistan and in Iraq in achieving the objectives to have regime change. So in those limited uh, scopes, I think we were successful on the battlefield. The problem, of course, has been nation building. But that's not that we say we can't win a war. Uh, for uh, Luke, two clarifications, rebuttals, clarifications. First on Snowden, um, his lawyer certainly is far left, and the position that Snowden has taken is a far left position. But in the United States, the far right and the far left are one and the same when it comes to the type of things that Snowden reveals. For instance, Luke mentions the fact that uh, Snowden claims to have voted for Ron Paul. Ron Paul is a Republican congressman who I know very well. Uh, I was the chief spokesman and the foreign policy advisor for one of the presidential candidates in 2012, so I saw Dr. Paul all around the country at debates. And the fact is Dr. Paul is an isolationist, and he's a Republican, but for fiscal issues. When it comes to foreign policy, he's far to the left of Obama. Under a President Paul administration, you'd have a nuclear-armed Iran very quickly. NATO would fall apart quickly because he would t remove all the U.S. forces from bases in the U.S. So that's the kind of Republican we're talking about with that word Snowden, an isolationist Republican that's basically one and the same of the far left. Now, having said that, uh, Luke is, uh, about 30% of the people in America agree with Luke. That, uh, that Snowden's a whistleblower, a hero, et cetera. Uh, most people disagree, but about 30% do, and that's the combination of the far left and the far right. Uh, the second clarification rebuttal is about national espionage. Every country does espionage in the world, otherwise they'd lose out economically, diplomatically, and military. Every single country does espionage. Now that espionage is to the size and scope of the size of the country and the threats to that country. So uh, I was talking to folks here today from Albania, South Africa. Sure, they have espionage. Is it, are they doing PRISM? Of course not. But that, they're not threatened by a 9-11. They're not a threatened with thousands of people being killed by radical Islamist terror groups either on any given day. So yeah, everybody does espionage. It's bad to get caught. But clearly, the US was doing more than other countries because of the size of the country, the leadership role that it's traditionally played, and the current threats it faces. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah I, I just wanted to um, pick up on um, uh, Nikolai's point about th this kind of misunderstanding, y you and your American wife, ex-wife, I don't know, um, the, 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 the Western, Western political elites and the Russian intelligence community, because I think one very important area where we haven't really uh, talked about today is kind of propaganda and kind of narrative, because I spent much of this year reporting from 
uh, Ukraine, from Kiev, from Donetsk, from Luhansk. Um, and it's quite extraordinary if you read uh, the, the Russian state media account of what is happening in Ukraine and you read the Western account, the sort of stuff I write, it's as if we're, we're talking not about the same country but two different planets, essentially. The Russian media say neo-Nazis backed by the United States seize power in February. Um, and, you know, poor old Russia was obliged to save Crimea from this fascist peril. That, that's the story. Um, and the, the, the Western narrative is completely different. It's, it's essentially that this was a kind of popular uprising which had some far right elements, but as kind of minor rather than major motifs. Um, and that Yanukovych ran away, taking about $30 billion with him, which is more or less what I've written. Um, and what's interesting is that these, you know, whenever any of us, journalists who cover Eastern Europe, who cover Ukraine, we write an article for The Guardian, uh, the, the Wall Street Journal, The New York Times, you, you, you see in the comments below the line, you see this kind of clash of narratives between people with a kind of Western mindset and people who watch Russian state television um, and uh, basically sort of do the kind of um, the, the Kremlin view, but I think what's interesting is is that the state that I thought Nikolai described is spending, you know, millions and millions of dollars on propaganda. Russia Today, an army of bloggers who who now write English, who write on my website, who whenever I write anything say that I'm a fool, an idiot, a spy, a Russophobe. Um, the fool and the idiot, okay, but but the, the rest is untrue, um, and. What's interesting is, you know, we, we talk about the Cold War, which was a kind of a, a military war, and we have an ongoing military conflict in Ukraine, but, but people I talk to who's, who are plugged into kind of the way the Russian presidential administration thinks say that the, the, the war now is the war for the mind. It's the war for the mind, and, and that, that's kind of where this kind of informational war, I think, in the last kind of year, the last nine months especially, has reached extraordinary unprecedented levels. And I think it's important because I think it's a major strategic threat um, to, to the West and the European Union. Thank you. I just, um, in, my, in the interest of saving time, I noticed that I had skipped in my notes thanking the Antel Center. So I apologize, <laughs> number one. And number two, I want to thank the Antel Center for um, bringing me to Budapest. And I also want to note that I sort of feel at some level that I've always been a Hungarian student because um, I had the tremendous opportunity when I was in college of studying with Lieutenant General Bela Karai, who had come to the United States after 1956, and I had the chance to study with him for two years in, in my college where he taught military history. So for me, it's especially wonderful to be here. So I apologize for not having said that sooner. Now, one comment on the papers. I think one, one of the things that all the panels prove is the importance of history. It is very, very hard to be a good analyst if you do not understand history. Uh, Jim Clapper, who is the uh, Director of National Intelligence in the United States, has a wonderful line, the history of rock and roll did not begin the day you turned on the radio. <laughs> you have to know what happened before you got there. And to understand a lot of the things that all four panels have been talking about is exactly that. You have to understand precedent and culture and historical experience, because none of these issues began this afternoon. And some of them go back centuries and centuries. Well. Uh Putin really made fun of this um, Obama's line when he said, you know, Putin's on the wrong side of history. And uh, Putin said, let's see who's on the wrong side of history because we have our national version of history and Obama doesn't know history. So that's very important, not only to know history, but somehow to come up with a joint version of history, what's happened, you know? But what, what I wanted to point out uh, after all these presentations, it's a mystery to me. Maybe you guys can explain to me. But I'm trying to struggle with this question for a while. Every Russian leader after the collapse of the Soviet Union coming to the office, Gorbachev, Yeltsin, Putin, Medvedev, coming to the office with intent to improve, drastically improve relations with the United States. Basically, every, of, come, every one of them coming to office as a pro-American politician. And a few years later, they turning to be extremely anti-American. It's happened to Gorbachev, happened to Yeltsin, happened to Putin, happened to Medvedev. What's happened between first day in office and like a few years later? Whose fault is that? Who basically making Russian leaders into American leaders of the world? 
whose responsibility. So that's, you know, interesting question to think about and to analyze. I'm not ready to give the answer yet, but, you know, listening Putin's once, several times I heard from him on a different occasions in a small group sometimes, how much he likes American uh, political structure, for instance. He's quite pro-American. He said, you know, if only in Russia we could have this kind of political system with two big powers on the top, struggling for presidential elections, with a lot of multi-party uh, system on the bottom, with this grassroots democracy, but only a couple parties goes to the top. Why do we need prime minister? We need to have a vice president who will, you know, be kind of second president responsible for everything, and president will, as uh, in the United States, will, you know, be responsible for everything. Why can't we be like an American inside? And I think he has a great, great respect for American structure, political structure, you know, and this domestic political life. He doesn't believe in American democracy, definitely. He believes that American democracy based on money. He, many, on many occasions he said, who has more money has more rights. What's the difference between United States and Russia? And Russia who can cry louder has more rights. In America who has more money has more rights. That's the only difference. Uh, but what he really, not accept now, I think, in American, uh, on American side is American foreign policy, which was actually, I would give him a credit. It took him a long time. Remember, from 2008, took him years and years and years and years before he came up to München and gave his uh, München speech. And if after München speech, he really, think about it, he didn't do anything practical, which would put America in a corner. He didn't, do any, he didn't make any political decision. It was rhetoric. And then he's waited another few years, and only months ago in Valdai, he gave a pure anti-American speech, when basically, as I said, he closed the door. He doesn't want to talk to the United States anymore. He left the door open for European Union, but he shut the door for the United States. He didn't even offer any kind of cooperation. So it took him 15 years. So I would give him a credit for you know, kind of patience on the United States on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. No, uh, after this round, I would like to ask a question. There is a problem for the speakers. We have uh, heard different views about whether we face a new Cold War or we have a different new situation. Taking this, I would like to ask you whether you think is there any common interest, any field for cooperation on the field of the intelligence gathering activities of the United States and Russia? And if so, where is the limit? Um, well, I think there is, uh, any, intelligence sharing stems from the fact that you have common policies. You don't just wake up and say, hey, let's share intelligence, this is great. Um, we and the Russians have areas of commonality. We both have concerns about Muslim extremism. We both have concerns about non-proliferation of nuclear weapons, although when we get to Iran, there are shades of difference. We both have concerns about terrorism. Um, we both probably have um, a shared interest in global economic stability. So I think there are issues where you could suggest a certain profitability of ex intelligence exchange. I mean, the, the relationship is clearly not as antagonistic as it was before. And in these areas, I think you could possibly exchange intelligence to, to some success. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I um, absolutely kind of agree with Mark's um, impeccable Cartesian logic, but maybe I could just give you one image, which is the FSB calendar from 2013, uh, which has the logo of the Central Intelligence Agency, agency burning in flames with a sword and shield uh, behind it, triumphing over, over, over the perfidious American spies. Um, and certainly, you know, what I, I experienced, which I sort of talked about rather humorously, um, makes me feel that, that you're right about everything you say, Mark, but that there's a profound lack of trust, and more than that, m more than that, there's a kind of, I would say, an a prioristic view from, from the KGB elite, from Putin himself, um, which is zero sum. In other words, what, what, is, what is good for Russia is bad for America. What is good for Russian intelligence is bad for American intelligence. So I see in the current configuration, uh, no way of any dialogue whatsoever. 
I would say that the biggest fear of Putin and his circle uh, was exactly what Jeffrey said, regime change. They believe, seriously believe, that American intention is to change regime in Russia. And so any way, only way to change regime in Russia to get rid of Putin, one way or another. I don't know how realistic this and how deep this idea embedded in Washington, but in Moscow they really believe that that's what America wants. It's for any cooperation, for any intelligence sharing, for anything, but with one goal to destroy Putin's regime. And that's the biggest obstacle. I don't know how, how hypothetical is that, but this is the biggest obstacle for Russia today to cooperate with the United States. Two fears, regime change and uh, color revolution. Russia is uh, really paranoid about color revolution and they're really afraid that next color revolution could be in Moscow or somewhere in Russian provinces. And regime, Putin's regime now, put as a main goal is uh, for itself, is goal to survive, to survive as they believe Western American attack on Russia. On Valdai, a few, few, few weeks ago, I was there when his uh, top administra administration official said, attack on Putin is attack on Russia. No Putin, no Russia anymore. That's how they see the situation. Do you like it or not, but that's for them, Intellig for, for intelligence cooperation, this is a bigger thing. 86, according to latest poll, 86% of Russians believe that criticism, like Luke does, criticism of, of Russia in Western media means Western media wants to destroy Russia, period. That's the reality, thank you. I would just add one thing to that, like uh, Mark was saying about the threat from radical Islam, both US and Russia, and all of Europe for that matter, share a great threat from radical Islamists, whether they're terror groups or radicalized individuals. Uh, actually, the US and Russia have shared intelligence before. For the uh, Boston Marathon bombing, we had the Sarnia brothers who were ethnically Chechen, and one of the brothers had been to Dagestan, training with terrorists over there. Well, the Russian authorities told the US intelligence authorities who didn't do enough about it. We could have stopped the Boston Marathon bombing had the US intelligence authorities taken the Russian warnings more seriously. So I think there is room for, for collaboration, even though there are a lot of problems with US and Russia, obviously, today. I think there is room for collaboration for mutual threats. Thank you very much. And other question. Uh, do you think, has the intelligence any impact on the relation between the two countries? Uh, do you think has the intelligence any impact on the on the uh, well? I, I believe relations between the two countries. I believe with what Mark said. You know, good intelligence uh, help to predict behavior and make uh, uh, educated decisions. Now I don't think intelligence serve its goal, and uh, I think for now on the Russian side, at least I believe uh, intelligence. Uh, playing a negative, quite negative role on the relations. I think um, one of the things that's funny about intelligence analysis is it depends who you're briefing and how do they take intelligence. I'm hard put to believe that you could say, I'm mean, going back to what Nikolai said and what, what Luke said, I'm hard put to believe if you were a Russian intelligence professional presenting a brief to President Putin that actually painted the US in a less than malign light that the briefing would go very well. And that's part of the problem. Um, I just don't think that would go down well. And so you can't sell somebody some, an, an intelligence point of view that they're not willing to accept. And Putin seems to be on a track where it wouldn't matter. In terms of US intelligence, my sense is that Russia is, this is one of the things that galls them, is pretty far down on the list at this point. There are a lot more pressing problems, and Russia is just not there. So it's, it's less of an issue, I think, for U.S. policymakers. And don't forget that Putin himself is an intelligence officer. So he, he considered an authority on that. So but he wasn't an analyst. Yeah, but he, he considered himself as a guy who can judge right. bad intelligence, good intelligence. So he doesn't need advisors, he thinks. 
But uh, I mean, I mean, just to, to pick up on, on, on what Mark and Nicholas are saying, I, that, that's part of the problem is that Putin doesn't use the internet. He, he doesn't read newspapers. He relies very heavily on briefs from the FSB. And of course, they, as Mark says, they tell him what he wants to hear. Um, and there's a danger of a feedback loop where you start believing your own propaganda. You know, you, I mean, Putin really does think there are neo-Nazis and American special advisors holding hands on the streets of Kiev. I mean, that, that, that's what he thinks because that's what his intelligence services are telling him. But one quick anecdote on this. Um, when I was the Guardian correspondent, um, I did a lot of time trying to investigate top level corruption and I did one story in 2007 based on sources inside the presidential administration uh, and Transparency International uh, and others suggesting that Putin was worth about $40 billion because the whole subject of Putin's wealth is completely taboo. Now, now Putin didn't comment on that story for three months and I subsequently discovered that it was because no one in his presidential administration would bring this story to him. No one wanted to bring the bad news to the Tsar, and so he never found out about it until about eight weeks later. Uh, can you imagine that in, in America, Obama being accused of massive corruption and not commenting for two months? I think those were all excellent points that the three uh, co-panelists brought up. Uh, you know, one of the big differences, I think, in just philosophically, if you look at the United States and Russia, is the... President of Russia doesn't want to get bad news. He's very insulated from it, has his own decisions. And I think the, the, uh, the government in Russia protects their own. If you look at what just happened in the United States, the son of the vice president was just kicked out of the Navy for cocaine use. Does anybody honestly believe that if Vladimir Putin, the son, was kicked out of the military, that they wouldn't, rather if he got busted for cocaine, he'd be kicked out? I think that's just kind of a, uh, tells a lot about the different societies that we have in the U.S. and Russia, where the U.S. is very rule of law, very transparent. Doesn't matter if you're the son of the vice president. If you're doing cocaine, you'll get kicked out of the Navy. It'll be a national news story. I just don't see the same thing would have ever happened in Russia. Don't forget that was the same son of vice president who was just appointed to the top of the Ukrainian oil company by Americans. So that's what Russians made fun of saying, America is the most corrupted country because son of vice president going to Ukraine and get appointed to energy company as a vice president in the, this, in the middle of the crisis, how corrupted it could be more. Thank you very much. Now can we open the floor to the question of the audience? Please, if you will, just uh, ask a question. Please, uh, by the introducing, please give us your name and the organization you represent. Okay, my, okay. <clears throat> my name is Mark Kramer from Harvard University. Um, first, a quick point, a factual point is, Russia, demographic trends came up twice here. Russia's population stabilized in 2007, and since 2011, it has risen every year. It's, it still hasn't undone wholly the sharp decline from earlier years, but it is no longer shrinking in average uh, life expectancy. Sorry to interrupt you. Can you please give your name and the organization? You I, I did. Do uh, okay. you want me to do it again? Or I, I can do it three times if you want, but it's uh, Mark, Kramer, Mark Kramer from Harvard University. Um, just so Russia's population at this point is no longer shrinking. In fact, average life expectancy is at an all time high right now. It, it again, doesn't change, I think, the point that you were trying to get at, but if you're going to cite certain trends, be sure they still exist. Um, with regard to, uh, I, I was surprised that, I hope that Luke Harding was aware of the continuity that the FSB and the SVR uh, perceived between themselves and the KGB before he was in prison. I, I, I there, were, there were a book, there have been numerous books put out by the FSB, one that called Lubyanka, another Lubyanka Dva, and uh, if you look in both of those books, it, it makes no distinction between the Soviet era state security organs, and, and those came out in the 1990s. Um, and uh, in every edition since then has done the same. So, yeah, yeah, or if you look at the FSB website or other things of that, so it's no great revelation to see the names on that glass in the, the foot of a prison. Um, with regard to uh, 
finally, uh, with um, Mark Lowenthal's nostalgia about the Cold War was, uh, let me just take issue with um, two things. One about, in the written version of the presentation I gave here, which is quite a bit longer, I go through systematically to debunk one of the things that Mark mentioned about that there were clear rules of the game. Um, and the two superpowers abided by them. You know, in, both in crises and outside crises, both sides regularly violated what the other thought was um, a procedure. So you have to go through and actually look at the events, and you find that most of that notion of rule, rules of the game is, is pure mythology. Um, it, and then with regard to what the, uh, I don't recall which intelligence director it was that you mentioned, but who talked about the loss of the Soviet Union as the loss of the, um, the enemy we knew and loved. I mean, there, was, there were still brave Soviet citizens being shot in the Gorbachev period, much less before Gorbachev. Um, for having spied for the United States. In, in many cases, they actually were spies. You know, in a few cases, it, presumably, they were not. And, um, but particularly after the Walkers and then Aldrich Ames and Robert Hansen revealed names of people, I mean, you know, so if he really loved them, then uh, I, I think why were they I, shooting his own Professor people? Professor Kramer, I think you misunderstood the quote. And I'm going to disagree with you about that. I spent the first half of my career in the Cold War. And with all due respect to your academic research, there were rules. They were unwritten. It's like baseball. There were unwritten rules. In football, there were unwritten rules. There were rules. They were sometimes violated, but we both had a sense of boundary. And to argue that that didn't exist is just contrary to the experience that I had for 15, 20 years. As for the quote from Director Clapper, who's the current director of National Intelligence, what he was saying was that we had reached a level of comfort and familiarity in some way with the Soviet problem, having spent almost half a century on it, and that when it disappeared, we were suddenly adrift. That's that, you, mis you misunderstood Jim Clapper's quote. That's what he meant when he said, we lost the enemy we came to know and love. He didn't mean love in the positive emotional sense. He meant love in the professional comfort level sense that when you went to work on the Soviet problem in the morning, you knew what you were doing. I did Soviet missiles for 10 years, <laughs> SS-18s, SS-19s, SSN-21s. I knew what I was doing every day. You're doing ISIL and you're going, oh my God, I'm back in the 12th century. Yeah, but, there were, there were, but there were people in the intelligence uh, you know, community I think studying we take, terror. Instead of making this a debate, I think we should yeah. take this offline. Okay, and let people one come. last yeah. point about the parade, victory parade. Um, on Christmas Day, 1989, there was a grand concert in West Berlin, which uh, Le Leonard Bernstein went to, and the feature there was a, ver you know, a celebratory version of Beethoven's Ode to, uh, Ode to Joy, except the word Freude was replaced by Freiheit, you know, Ode to Freedom. So it was a celebration of freedom. I think that was a lot more meaningful and, and certainly moving than any victory parade would have been. Yeah, just, for, just very briefly, Mark, on, on your point, I wasn't expecting expressing surprise. I mean, I agree with you. There is continuity between the FSB, the SVR, the KGB. The, the difference is that during the, during the late 90s, as you know, the FSB was on its back foot and was kind of under-resourced. And in the first Putin presidential term, these kind of spooky methods were generally not being used. Um, and what happened to me and to others, was there, was, there was a massive escalation from, I would say, the kind of post-2003 Kilikovsky onwards. Um, that's the difference. Just like to add a real quick um, rebuttal slash clarification for Mark as well on the population for Russia. Uh, the fact is it has shrunk 5 million people in 20 years and the population that's growing significantly is the Muslim population. So my point was by 2050 it could be a Muslim uh, majority country. Um, it doesn't do Vladimir Putin a lot of good to have a lot of new Russians that are Chechens or from Dagestan. It does them no good at all. Um, and I have a chart that I show and some other briefs, not on this one today, unfortunately, by region, population growth and decline in Russia. And if you look at the, uh, the white, ethnic, Slavic, uh, Orthodox, Christian areas, Moscow and the surrounds, they're big red circles, minus 8% a year, minus 10% a year. If you look at Chechnya, Dagestan, and Gusechia, bright green plus 13 a year, plus 10 a year, plus 80 a year. If you look at the regions north of Kazakhstan, Muslim majority areas too, 
bright green, plus 10 year. So it doesn't do Vladimir Putin a lot of good to have growth in the Muslim areas because he doesn't want his country to be a Muslim majority country, which is why he's trying to take over, why he's succeeding to take over parts of Ukraine, why he's continuing to occupy parts of Georgia, and why if he's left unchecked and NATO is not strong enough, he may take parts of other countries as well because he wants that uh, ethnic Russian entirety. He's trying to save Russia. He thinks that Russia was cheated out of 25 million people with the fall of the Cold War, what he calls these false Leninist lines, what Rush, the Russian inner circle calls. Russians feel they've been cheated by the end of the Cold War, which is why he said in 2005, the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of the 20th century was the fall of the Soviet Union, which is why in 2001, starting in 2001, the Russian government every year passed either a new law or policy, number one, to give Russian passports to Russian speakers in surrounding countries, number two, to authorize military force to protect those Russian speakers, and number three, to have a formal petition that they could become annexed with the, with the Russian country. So he, in law and policy, there's three steps right there. It is law and policy that Russia is authorized per their own laws to take over and annex places like Donetsk and Luhansk. That's five million people right there. They've already made up that population loss of 20 years. So I think it's just more important to kind of see where that population growth is and is not. Well, uh, again, you know, I'm just going on the basis of the facts, which, which are in World Bank databases. You know, they show that the, uh, there is certainly has been a shrinkage. I mentioned that. It hasn't fully undone the shrinkage that occurred from the early, early 1990s through 2007. But it is wrong to describe it as a shrinking population. It hasn't been for seven years now. And um, it is also not just because of, the, of course there are differential birth rates. That's, that's been a phenomenon dating back to the Soviet period. But, it, uh, but the total fertility rate among ethnic Russians also has been going up for the last four to five years. So it is not just that mo the Muslim populations are increasing. Okay. I would just add uh, kind of one number to this discussion. There's uh, approximately 20 million Muslims live in Russia. So I have a hard time to imagine in 30 years they will take over half of the population. Something wrong with the calculation here. But, and you have to consider Article 13, Russian Constitution is still there, that Russia respects international law over its national laws. So far, nobody was able to take this article out of the Constitution. There are some attempts. So far, officially, Russia is respecting international law, and if Russian national law is a conflict with international law, Russia will take international law as a rule. Didn't apply to Crimea. Okay, so we are waiting for the next question. I apologize for speaking again, but uh, my name is Rudolf Turkish, and I'm at the University of Connecticut. I mean, these demographic number games are very interesting, but I'm far more interested in the collateral damage of the current uh, US-Russian or indeed international relations. By collateral damage, I am referring to the um, st status of the homeland. Now, the Bible of US uh, intelligence analysis would be Sherman Kent's uh, writings. And of course, he has a very important em emphasis on the status of the homeland. Now, there is the USA with all kinds of domestic issues um, involving anything, uh, elections bought and sold for a pittance of $6 billion, uh, corruption stinking to high heavens, um, the in and out movement of senior government personnel from the intelligence community to the business community and back. So we are talking about a very confusing scene. We are also talking about the militarization of society. But by that, you have to really live there. When you see soldiers coming back from Afghanistan, Iraq, elsewhere, uh, for one thing, they are definition called heroes. Well, 
some of them are, some of them are not. But then they return after being called heroes. The system neglects them with respect to their physical and psychological wounds there. And they're uh, coming back to a country. Uh, sorry to interrupt you, Mr. Turkish. Can you come to the question? Oh, I'm coming there. Thank you very much. Anyway, so the status of the homeland, therefore, ought to inform intelligent estimates with respect to threat perceptions from Russia and elsewhere. The second point, if I may, uh, involves this very peculiar saber rattling by Russia. Uh, a humorous example how Russian strategic bombers over international waters went all the way to Spain and back. Now, what was the point in doing that? I mean, the Western Air Forces could have taken out the whole bunch in 10 minutes. Then there is another Russian initiative involving developing an alternative to the International Monetary Fund or the World Bank. Again, the dollar bills are not printed in Moscow or in Beijing, but they're being printed in Washington. In other words, there are these uh, games that are being played which add to atmospherics but do not contribute to a, 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 a rational, reasoned, negotiated uh, resolution of issues separating the two sides. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Do you have any other question? Yes, please. concluding session, you should, uh, we should like to find something uh, after confronting different views, getting together, something common, something resolution of our uh, today conference. My question is such a question. How can uh, the United States, Russia uh, share intelligence in fighting Islamic extremists. This is a deep concern for the United States and for Russia and for all the globe as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, I think we have uh, talked about this issue, how to change and how to cooperate between the two countries. And our speaker has spoken about this issue. Thank you very much. A... Egy, kettő, igen. Bánhegyi Zsolt vagyok, Pesti polgár, nem képviselek semmiféle intézményt. Mint Zobin úrtól is meghallottuk, és amúgy is sokan tudjuk, Oroszország vezetésében a, a hírszerzők és a katonatiszti réteg igen fontos szerepet játszik. Ők a birodalmi gondolat jegyében szocializálódtak. Súlyos érzelmi csapást is jelentett erre a meghatározó rétegre, már az is, hogy elvesztették Németországot, úgy érték meg, hogy hatalmas áldozatokat hoztak érte, és ingyen feladták lényegében, Utána pedig len a Szovjetunió felbomlása még inkább ebbe az irányba hatott. Most, amikor kemény amerikai pénzek segítségével Ukrajnában megdöntöttek egy lényegében demokratikusan megválasztott és ennek a felhatalmazásnak a birtokában kormányzó elnököt, akinek amúgy is lejárt volna pár hónapon belül, most decemberben a mandátuma, akkor egy olyan gárda került ezáltal hatalomra, amelyiknek első intézkedése az volt, hogy betiltotta az ország felének az anyanyelvét. Ukrajna 40 millió lakosából kb. 12 ukrán, és még másik 8 millió ukránnak is orosz az anyanyelve. Most feltételezte bárki Washingtonban, és akkor most Löwenthal urat szeretném kérdezni, hogy egy ennyire frusztrált orosz vezetés bele fog nyugodni abba, hogy 12 millió orosz és még plusz 8 millió 
egy nyugati szövetségi rendszer alatt valójává váljon. Méghozzá teljesen nyilvánvalóan antidemokratikus módon ezt hangsúlyoznunk kell. Én nem hiszem, hogy ezt komolyan gondolták. De ön kérem, válaszoljon erre. Ha mégis komolyan gondolták, akkor ennek a miértjére egyetlen logikus válasz adódik csak, amit Nógrádi György szokott lépte nyomon, talán ismerik az urak ennek a, ennek a biztonságpolitikai magyar szakértőnek a nevét, aki a leggyakrabban szerepel a magyar médiában. Ő az egészet azzal magyarázza, hogy tulajdonképpen az Egyesült Államok szándékosan akart egy konfliktust szítani, ami egyrészt gyengíti Oroszországot, mert, a, mert Oroszország nem lehetett abban a helyzetben, hogy a nemzetközi joggal összhangban oldja ezt meg, csak erőszakkal teheti. Ugyanakkor konfliktus generál Oroszország és az EU között is, és ezáltal egyszerre gyöngíti mind a két konkurensét. Az EU-t is, amelynek sok pénzébe kerülnek a szankciók, és Oroszországot is. Mi a véleményük az uraknak erről? Um, hi. Um, I, I think I got most of that by the translation. Basically, with, with respect, um, uh, what, what you say is not true. That's not actually what happened in Ukraine. I mean, I, I was there. The, uh, Yanukovych was not uh, overthrown by US dollars, as you say. Um, and I think part of the problem is that Vladimir Putin and the people around him can't believe that anybody, any demonstration, whether it's in Hong Kong, whether it's in Kiev, whether it's in Georgia, could happen spontaneously. It always has to be the US State Department and Hillary Clinton, when she was there, paying people to demonstrate. And that, that isn't what happened in Kiev. What happened was that uh, a bunch of largely middle-class people were very upset in November when Yanukovych decided to kind of tear up this association agreement with the European Union and to take a massive bailout from Moscow instead. Um, they gathered, um, they continued to gather, um, and they were kind of increasingly brutally suppressed by Yanukovych's security forces in January and again in February when um, 100 people were shot dead by Yanukovych's interior ministry snipers. Now, that, that is what happened. And in that context, Yanukovych then ran away. There was no physical threat to him. He wasn't overthrown. He decided to, to in the dead of night, leave his, his palace with its kangaroos and its pirate ship uh, and so on um, and, and flee to, to Russia. This was a popular uprising. It was broad-based. It was not US dollars. Um, and essentially, what Putin did, as we know, is exploited this crisis to annex Crimea, Uh, and to instigate a wholly artificial war in the east of the country. I've spent a long time this year in Donetsk. People there were fed up with Kiev, absolutely, but there was not a majority for secession. There was certainly not a majority for uh, armed conflict. Um, and and the, the whole situation there is artificial. I've always, uh, I'm, I, I can't add anything on that point to what Luke said. I would just, I've always liked a comment made by Zbigniew Brzezinski who is President Carter's national security advisor. Now, obviously, Mr. Brzezinski, having been a native Pole, has a somewhat jaundiced view towards the Soviet Union. Um, but he said that without Ukraine, Russia is a nation. With Ukraine, Russia is an empire. There is a strong preference in terms of global stability to have Russia as a nation. I agree uh, 100% with Luke on that. I've been uh, following Ukraine quite a bit, and uh, in fact, I'm going there on this trip as well. Um, there's a lot of conspiracy theories in the world about the United States and about U.S. power. Uh, very quickly, one of my favorite anecdotes, George Mitchell's a former U.S. Senator and a, he's been a, a U.S. Um, special envoy, and he basically talks about a guy in Pakistan turns on the water in the morning in the shower, and it's first no water, and then it comes out cold, and he says, ah, it's the CIA and Obama again. So I think that there is just too many conspiracy theories about the United States out there that are unhelpful. So, and I think the media around the world tend to fan those flames. And it, I think you <laughs> draw a conclusion right back to Russia TV, one of the biggest propaganda outlets against the United States, which Americans watch. And oh, by the way, they have a lot of uh, uh, environmental programming, anti-fracking. So they, the Russians try to convince Europeans not to have exploit their shale gas. Same with the U.S. Greens, so they can buy Russian oil and buy Russian natural gas. I think people have to peel the onion back, so to speak, peel the layers back when they see these conspiracy theories to try to debunk them the best they can. So thank you for that. And uh, two, two points very, very quickly. First of all, the Russian political elite does believe in this statement from Brzezinski. This is why Washington behave as it behave. It won't separate Russia from uh, Ukraine. That's the main goal. Kremlin believes that uh, American and Western 
including European Union policy toward Ukraine, it's not toward Ukraine, it's toward Russia. It's anti-Russian politics. That's it. How, this is how they took it, and they blamed Brzezinski for creating this idea. Uh, but the question is, and I can address it back to you, uh, Yanukovych was thrown away when he decided to postpone treaty with European Union. So he left, and Poroshenko did postpone the treaty with the European Union to the very same period as Yanukovych offered, and he's still there. Thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Albert Sabu. I am a senior member of the Advanced College for Security Policy um, at National University of Public Service. And I have a question. So uh, I have heard some news about a um, private military camp, um, private military, um, so like the Blackwater uh, military, what? So, yeah, companies. And uh, so they are in uh, in in uh, Ukraine. And uh, is it force or not? And if it is force, what is the responsibilities of these troops? Uh, is Blackwater in Ukraine? Is, is that the question? No, no, no. Um, okay. Well, or, 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 I mean, I, <laughs> uh, I mean, it's, it's hard to say for sure, but I, I think it was highly unlikely. There were some wild tales going around. I remember in Luhansk being told that there were 100 black American snipers in a minibus at the next roundabout, but um, I, I didn't see them, uh, and I don't think they exist. Um, and I, I don't know, I mean, I mean I'm, I, I, all I can say on the ground, that I've seen no evidence of American or British or whatever observers. I have seen uh, people from the OSCE, um, including um, in Slavyansk, I was covering that story when they were kidnapped, I was in Slavyansk the same day, but these were people who were going around um, openly with ID, uh, without any kind of weapons, and who were, were kidnapped by the Donetsk People's Republic and, and uh, subsequently released. So uh, I, I'm not saying that America is not involved in Ukraine, I'm, I'm sure on many platforms it is, but I, it, overtly with troops, contractors, no, I don't believe that. My name is Gabor Zord. I'm from uh, Major Nemzer Daily Newspaper. And my question goes to um, the uh, Western lecturers. That, am I understand right that you say that there were no US support, either material uh, financing, behind the Ukrainian events? Is it correct? I understand right. There were no. So the Newland intercepted conversation, which was published uh, all around the world, is is a, created by Russian intelligence. So U.S. doesn't uh, invested, didn't invest five billion U.S. dollars in the Ukrainian democracy project. Thank you. Um, well, I, I mean. <laughs> I think it's hard to say that there was no American involvement at all, but what I can tell you is that from being in Kiev, this was not an American operation. This was a sort of spontaneous um, Facebook-generated, Twitter-generated protest by real Ukrainians who were fed up with corruption, with um, mafia rule under Yanukovych, and who demonstrated against it and, and uh, really enjoyed kind of popular support. I mean, if you were there at the time, Sure, you would see kind of young guys um, on the barricades who were protesting, but you'd also see old ladies cutting up stones. Now, maybe these old ladies were being paid by the US State Department. I, I, I don't know. I mean, you're, you're quite entitled to believe that. But um, th this, this was a kind of popular uprising, and it had different elements. It was part of a kind of you know, Occupy global style cycle of protest. It was partly a kind of Cossack rebellion going back to Ukrainian history. It was very much a kind of social network mediated uprising. But I think to suggest that it's always America behind these things denies that, that people living in countries have got agency, that they've got wills, that they've got kind of feelings of their own. Um, and from everything I saw, this was a, a genuine revolution, however it went, you may or may not agree with the outcome. It was not um, plotted or funded 
um, from outside. I agree with Luke on that, but I'm glad you brought up that phone call from Assistant Secretary Newland. Uh, you know, everybody likes to blame the United States for NSA, for espionage, but where's the outrage about the Russians intercepting her call? Now clearly it was inappropriate what she said, the FDU comment, I've done plenty of TV interviews on it and written columns about it, very inappropriate. She should have known better, she was talking to the US ambassador for the Ukraine, Ambassador Payet. I mean, uh, any rookie diplomat knows not to speak on an open line about a sensitive topic. They were talking about internal Ukraine issues, about what uh, Vitaly Klitschko should be doing, what uh, Arseny uh, Yatsenik should be doing, on an open line. But my point is, where is all the outrage against Russia? We see all the outrage against the United States for NSA, for the leaks that Snowden divulge. Where's the outrage about Russia uh, hacking into these calls and releasing them to the public? It, it's non-existent. So I think people have to look at that. I'm very glad you brought that point up. I was gonna mention it, I'm glad you did. I would add to this very good question. One thing, when uh, Newland on a different occasion mentioned this $5 billion, America spend on Ukrainian democracy. A lot of people in Russia ask Kremlin, why we didn't spend $10 million billion to keep it in the Russian sphere of influence? Don't we have enough money? Why we let Americans to spend this money and make Ukraine entire Russian country? It was way before Maidan, majority of Ukrainians did not like Russia. So what was wrong in Russian policy toward Ukraine? Russia, remember, constantly was cutting gas to Ukraine, putting embargoes on certain uh, Ukrainian uh, agricultural products and so on, making Ukrainian life is very hard. And people now asking, you know, who was responsible for this lousy policy, Moscow policy toward Ukraine? And that's by 2013, majority of Ukrainians did did not like Russia, did not like Putin, didn't want to be associated with Moscow. So it doesn't matter how much Americans spend, it's every country trying to um, increase its influence in the world, that's normal. But why Russia let America to do it? Why, why Russia left Ukraine in a vacuum? You know, America can go so far as far as Russians would let them go. So why did we let them go so far and basically already took Ukraine from us? That's a much more important question. Thank you. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. According to the timetable, we have come to the end of this panel. And as a moderator of this panel, I would like to thank you for your attention. And I would like to thank uh, to our distinguished speakers to, for their comprehensive lectures. Uh, summarizing, they have given us a lot of additional knowledge, and at the same time, they draw to our attention to a lot of new questions. Thank you very much.